Hi, this is Nick Pizai. This video is a miscellaneous water plant operator logical question exam or quiz that we put together to help uh, operators prepare for exams as always. Also to help them reason through uh, different kinds of problems that they might uh, face in their, in their water treatment processes. We'll have a little discussion about that. Let me share this screen with you here. You know, taking uh, water treatment plant licensing exams has proven to be challenging for many operators over the years. Uh, a lot of pressure from the time restrictions under which you have to take the exams and the reasoning that you have to do to answer some of the questions have been difficult for a lot of people. But we noticed that the exams have gotten a lot easier over the years. Uh, old timers like me think that's so. It's an opinion that we share with a lot of others because we think the testing conditions have changed. For example, we typically provide you with a formula and a conversion sheet when you take these exams. And back in the old days, they didn't have to. You had to memorize all those things. Uh, they don't require you to know any of the old procedures which have disappeared due to improvements in everything from laboratory supplies to computer uh, power, which does a lot of the work for us now, things that you had to know how to do back in the old days. Now, the people who create the test reason that you shouldn't have to memorize formulas when you can easily look it up on a book, and, and to some extent that's true, of course. But seasoned operators also know that under emergency and stressful conditions, you may not have time to look in a book. It's more important for you to be able to reason through things that you uh, can pull on from your knowledge reservoir in your brain and, and figure out how to do things under pressure. So the superintendents are telling me that they no longer depend on the exam process, the learning process for exams to train their operators to reason. Rather, they find alternative ways to train these guys. Hence, I put together this sample quiz. So try your skill at answering these former exam questions. And remember, like the parent has to tell his child who always says, why do I have to know this stuff? I'm never gonna use it. Well, it isn't what you know, it's your ability to think through what you don't know that helps you in there. Take, make decisions under pressure. So let's try these. Here's one we don't see on the exams too many times anymore, but this is the breakpoint chlorination. They give you a, a chart here or a table with samples A through L, and uh, they have the applied chlorine uh, dosage and the residual. And they tell you to calculate the pounds per million gallons needed to produce 0 0.4 milligrams per liter free residual. So the answer is on the next page, but if you want to stop the video now, you can go ahead and try to work that through. I'm going to answer that for you. This happens to work with the chlorine curve that so, uh, used to be so popular for operators. The curve were, that showed you dosage uh, in milligrams per liter, and then the chlorine residual going up on the y axis, uh, vertical axis on the left. And you're looking for the 0 0.4 milligrams per liter, but the first step is to find that on a graph. You notice when you look through there that there's actually three paces on the graph where there's a 0 0.4 milligram per liter residual for chlorine. You have to find the spot where it's free available chlorine, which is what you're looking for. So only the third occurrence uh, after the bottom hump that you see down there at about 1.6, 1.7 milligrams per liter dosage, uh, tells you where the free available is beginning to, uh, beginning to be made in the chlorination process. So that point happens to correspond to about two milligrams per liter dosage. You get about 0.4 milligrams for your free available chlorine. So if I pick J as the answer, two milligrams per liter, multiply that by the 8.34, I would get 16.68 pounds per million gallons. Okay, let's try another one. This is the accuracy of flow for totalizers and meters. I give you this information. They tell you that a clear well is circular, 72 feet in diameter, and it's 20 feet deep. They tell you that the water level is allowed to drop 36 inches. Then they do a test. They tell you that all flow is pumped into the clear well through a venturi meter. You turn the pump on, the water level in the clear well rises 24 inches in 10 minutes. The meter measures flow at 6,697 gallon gallons per minute. And then they ask you to determine if the totalizer is A, accurate, B, 10% high, or C, 9% low. And they ask you this. I mean, if the meter is A, accurate, B, 10% high, or C, 10% low. So try to try and walk that, work that one through, and then go to the next page and see the answer. Here's what I came up with. 
looked at the totalizer and I looked at the meter. We had to compare these two and see which is accurate or high or low. So the totalizer first. The totalizer difference in gallons would be taking the uh, reading after you filled up the clear well uh, minus what you started with. So that comes out to about 60,879 gallons. But the actual rise in the clear well is computed by taking that two foot rise in 10 minutes and computing that to gallons. When I do that, I get the 0.785 times the 72 feet squared, diameter squared times two feet, converting that to gallons by 7.48, I get 60,879, which is exactly the same thing that the totalizer reads. So I conclude that the totalizer is accurate. While I'm here doing this, I want to note this. That 60,879 gallons was put in over 10 minutes. So that should be a rate of about 6,088 gallons per minute. Let's see what the meter actually did, though. They tell you that the meter measured a flow rate of 6,698. That's not exactly what you saw that just happened. You, you figured it was 6,088. That's a 600 gallon per minute difference. So the clear oil rose at 6,088 gallons per minute. The accuracy then would be 6,088 minus 6,698 divided by the 6,088. And I chose that way to do it to show you that it's a 10% difference uh, in the meter reading is higher than what you saw before. So the answer is meter is 10% high. Okay, let's try this one, corrosion control. In the old fashioned lime soda softening process, of course, they would always try to produce a lime softened water that would protect the distribution system rather than be aggressive water. So it would recarbonate the process just to the point where they would have a, a, a lime, soda pro, lime soda softened water just slightly corroding rather than slightly aggressive. So you wanted to put some alkalinity as calcium carbonate onto the mains to provide a protective coating. That was the idea. So they give you waters A, B, C, and D here, and they show you that before alkalinity and after alkalinity results. We show you for A, you went from 120 to 124 when it got into the system. Water B went from 64 to 64, no change. Water C went from 48 to 45. And water D went from 60 to 68. Which of those would be most suitable under the old way of doing things? Answers on the next slide. Think about it. So for corrosion control for lime softening systems, they often strive to put a uh, water into the system that is slightly scale forming so that the pipes are protected from aggressive water. The scale should not be too heavy or too thick, just enough to slowly put down a protective coating. So the action would be evidenced by a slight decrease in alkalinity, which indicates that a small amount of calcium carbonate is being deposited from the water under the pipe. So the answer then would be C. The alkalinity loss is 48 uh, down to 45 or 3 milligram per liter loss. It's the only one that is logical. So that's the answer C. All right, let's try another one. It's the pump insulation. I give you three diagrams, A, B, and C. Which diagram, A, B, or C, is the best insulation? That's all they tell you. Look at those and see what, what looks better to you. So here's the answer on the next slide. Pump insulation. As the water approaches the suction inlet of a pump, there's a tendency for air bubbles to be released from the water because you get this, this rush of water coming into the pump, you get a pressure differential. Any air that's in the water is going to tend to come out of, uh, out of bubbles, out of solution. Those bubbles can accumulate if you're not careful. If you have the wrong pipe insulation, you accumulate these, these air bubbles and you get these low flow conditions because they become appreciable in number. Now you're trying to, trying to suction air rather than just water. You want to avoid that. So the best strategy then is to install a fitting or a connection that allows the bubbles to continually rise as they approach the suction side of the pump along the pipe wall and be moved out with the flow. Sorry for the misspelling there. So the answer then would be C, where the level, the bottom part of the spool piece coming in the pipe goes up. Sorry for the lawn cutting today. Let's talk about corrosion. Ask you this question. I said, red water is experienced in one water main while there's no problem existing in any of the nearby mains of your system. You take a sample and you run it to the laboratory and they tell you that the water is non corrosive. So, what do you do? Think about that. I'm going to give you the answer on the same slide. Go out there and you reason that stray electrical currents in the area can cause soil to become corrosive. So, you should check the area for grounding from other utility lines, such as gas lines that have sacrificial anodes put into the ground. These other people, uh, these other utilities put their pipes in the ground. They don't want them to corrode. So they put sacrificial anodes. They put electricity into the ground. Uh, and those stray electrical currents can actually corrode your pipe if you have weakness of a pipe wall. So that's the thing you want to look for. If 
no problem exists anywhere else. I have scale to full scale. Let's try this one. The operator performs a jar test. She uses a stock alum solution of 10 grams per liter and finds that 2.8 milliliters produces the best results for her. So the alum feeder should be set to how many pounds per day when treating 2,500 gallon per minute? They give you the answers of choices of 84, 148, 840, and 1,480. Tricky answers. Let's see how they answer. Go to the next slide. 10 grams per liter uh, stock solution is the same as 10 milligrams per milliliter. So if she used 2.8 milliliters as the best dosage, that would be 10 times 2.8 or 28 milligrams per liter dosage is best for her. So she's treating at a rate of 2,500 gallon per minute. So I'm going to convert that to MGD by dividing by 694 and I come up with 3.6 MGD. I'm going to use the standard uh, formula for dosage. Pounds per day is going to equal to 28 milligrams per liter times the 3.6 MGD times 8.34. So 840 pounds per day is the answer. The answer is C. All right, pretty easy. Let's go to the next one. This is the feedlot runoff question. One of the old water plants had an impoundment reservoir. And they had a source water like a stream or a river that would ride by. And that source water would be subject, the stream would be subject to feedlot runoff. So they had a choice where they had the pump station. They could choose water to be pumped from the stream up to their storage reservoir and only on days when the water was good. The days when the water was more polluted, they wouldn't, they wouldn't transfer it to the impoundment reservoir. That was the beauty of the impoundment reservoir. You could choose only that water uh, that was the best source for you. So you had to be able to go down and take samples of the water and analyze it, determine do I want to pump today or don't I? So you have that option to pump the water. Which test should be run on the stream before you decide to pump water for today? They give you these choices. They give you number one choice, the carbon dioxide, hardness and bacteria test should be run. Second choice is dissolved oxygen, chlorides and nitrates. Third answer is chlorides, iron and phosphates. And the fourth is BOD, nitrates and dissolved oxygen. Go ahead and work that through and see if you uh, come up with an answer and we'll go to the next slide and figure it out. Okay, so you would want to pump water from the spring on the days when it showed no, no evidence of runoff from the feedlot. So your testing should indicate if pollutants have washed into the stream, of course. So you take a sample. You think that the feedlots are going to have cattle. Uh, so you're going to want to check for certain things that might be pertinent to, uh, to your supply here. So of course, if you have cattle, you're going to get urine into the stream on rainy days when there's runoff. So chlorides would be a good choice, of course. You're going to get manure and possible fertilizers used. So nitrogen is a the key. Therefore, nitrates, I think, would be a good choice. Then the last one would be that all of these pollutants are going to cause demand for oxygen. So dissolved oxygen, of course, would be a good choice. So the answer then is two. All right, hope you got through that one. All right, let's try the next one. This is the flow and elevation on how it affects pressure. I'll give you this drawing on the right where you have 200 gallon per minute coming into a, a system that branches off into a six inch pipe and a 10 inch pipe. I'll give you points A, B, C, and D. We'll show you that it's a thousand feet long. And A to B is a six inch pipe and C to D is a 10 inch pipe. Now, if you got 200 gallon per minute coming in and they tell you that 100 gallon per minute is going through the six inch pipe, you can reason then therefore that the under 100 gallon per minute has got to be going through the 10 inch pipe. So they give you these chances here, these choices here. Higher than C, lower than D, higher than A, higher than D, same as D. So they want to know the pressure at point B, which is it in relation to point B? We'll look at the next slide and we'll go to the answer here. According to the drawing, you had a flow of 200 gallon per minute coming into the split. 100 gallon per minute of it goes into the six inch line. That means the other line must be getting 100 gallon per minute also. So elevations are equal, so there's no pressure change due to elevation. All of it's got to be due to friction. So the two pipes are taking the same flow rate. The smaller of the two is going to have more friction. Uh, therefore, the two points downstream B and D differ only in friction amount. So I answer then the answer is B. Point B will be lower in pressure than point B. Okay, here's a basin capacity problem. I'll show you a drawing here of a flocculator emptying into two sedimentation basins that are 180 feet long, 50 feet wide each, and a weir at the end of each. They tell you that you have to take a basin out of service for some cleaning. You want to know the percent over capacity of the basin A 
if basin B is out of service for 18 hours for cleaning. We tell you that production was 7 million gallons in that 24 hour period. They also tell you the design flow for this system is 10 MGD. So go ahead and try to answer that and we'll find the answer on the next slide. And here's what I did. The basin operates at 7 MGD or that's 0 0.2916 million gallons for 18 hours. So for 18 hours times 0.2916 million gallons, you come up with a production of 5.25 million gallons through the basin. Now for the other six hours of the 24 hour period, we were operated at half that, three and a half MGD, because both basins were in service. So it was only taking half of the seven million gallons. So 0 0.0458 million gallons for six hours or 0.87. When I add those two numbers together, I come up with the basin having produced 6.12 million gallons for the 24 hours. Well, the basin was designed to handle 5 million gallons in 24 hours, but it produced 6.12. So I subtract the, six of the 5 million from the 6.12, and I come up with an excess uh, production of 1.12 million gallons. When I divide that 1.12 by the 5 million, I come up with about 22.4% over capacity for the 24-hour period. All right, here's the lime softening analysis problem. They tell you that you have two samples of softened water in your lab. Following our results of your testing for alkalinity and pH, why is there a difference? We look at our results of analysis and we have sample A and sample B. There's an alkalinity, phenolphthalein, there's a total alkalinity. In sample A, we have 37 and 42. In sample B, we have 37 and 42. The only difference is the pH of sample A is 10.6, sample B is 10.4. So they're asking you, sample A has been what? Refrigerated, heated, or neither, it just happens. So think about that for a little bit and answer on the next slide. Each of a lime softened water is generally going to decrease when you heat it up. When it begins to heat up or increases its temperature, the pH goes down. Therefore, sample B is warmer than sample A. It can only mean one thing sample A must have been refrigerated. So this is, the answer is one. Hope you did well on that. Look at our controls here and see what uh, is, uh, is coming up here in the way of some icons that you can click on to bring you some other videos. Hope this helped you a little bit. We'll come up with some more logical reasoning type samples and some other quizzes come down the road. So check in frequently. Thanks.